Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Retail Summit. My name is Vicente Partida, and I'm the Community Experience Officer at the Specialty Coffee Association. I'm coming to you today from my home in London. Thank you very much for joining us for day two of Retail Summit. We're calling this session Future Proofing Coffee Retail. We're going to be talking to Lindsay Harley about making decisions to provide for your business tomorrow. Lindsay is the founder and CEO of Modern Standard Coffee. Modern Standard is a specialty coffee roaster and retailer in the UK with a cafe in Edinburgh and a roastery in Lindsay's hometown of Glenrothes in Fife. You might know Lindsay from her background as a Q grader, UK cup tasters champion, barista competition judge, or as the former national coordinator of the SEA UK chapter. Today, Lindsay will share Modern Standard's journey from the decision to pull out of supermarket chain sales, coming home to Scotland, and partnering with Danish bakery chain Olenstein. Lindsay will share her story and give insights on how to take chances and approach future-proofing your retail coffee business. Lindsay, welcome. Hi, how are you? Thank you for, thank you for being with us. Brilliant. Okay, so we're going to um, yeah. hear from, from, from you, Lindsay, um, and I'm going to go away. I'll come back to chat with you sure. after your presentation. All right. So firstly, uh, thank, you for, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I really hope somebody finds this some, somewhat useful. So I've been asked to uh, share my story. So what I've tried to do here with coffee retail is to, is to divide it into three slices and explain the pros and cons of each and how you can use these to future-proof your business. So the first one being a uh, cafe roastery. Um, now, obviously we're not gonna be touching upon any wholesale here, just the retail, but the first type of, of retail for me is, is the cafe roastery cafe model. Um, it's one of the most attractive models of retail uh, to start with, and there's many reasons why. The first one being the fact you have a ha instant customer interaction. Customers can come in off the street, try your product the way that you want them to have it in the environment that you have created and the staff that you have trained. You're creating an experience in which you have a very high level of control and if customers like it, they'll probably tell their friends and, and they'll come back. This model though does tend to be very labor intensive and also very heavy on capital expenditure. Is uh, fitting at a cafe roastery can vary from as little as 50,000 pounds to half a million. It really depends on your location and what you, what you fit out your cafe with. Often, Though these models do lose a little bit of money at the beginning, uh, but if you're in a brand building phase, you can often justify these losses. The second option is the most common one, which is roastery web shop. So you have a website, you've launched a business, and you have created a coffee brand that you feel fits a gap in the market, which if exploited, will create a good return on your investment. In this model, Unlike the, the roastery cafe, you have a slightly lower customer interaction because you have a website and not a shop front. But what you can do to get people on your website is things like paid adverts, PR and search engine optimization, all the standard stuff we all know about. You also have a really high level of control over the customer experience. I mean, not as much as the cafe roastery as you do everything but make the coffee. But you roast and you pack your coffee and you can control the customer experience really well. The labor isn't as intensive as the roastery cafe and the capex can be zero if someone else roasts for you or it can be a light to medium if you opt to purchase your equipment and rent a space. And this model often results in quite quick profitability uh, if you hit enough customers to break even and like I said, this is often the most common way uh, people begin uh, a coffee retail business. And the third type is through the supermarket or through a reseller. And supermarkets, depending on what country you're in, can have as little as 40 stores na nationwide to 4,000. So their distribution is vast. And the majority of the public do their shopping here. So if you want to grow your brand quickly, this is a really good way to do it. 
However, listings with these supermarkets are notoriously tricky and the buyers are very aggressive at pushing the price down so they get the best deal. But you've got a very low customer interaction here and minimal control of their experience. Uh, labor is, is high because of the volume. And again, capital expenditure can be nothing if you have someone else roast or light to medium if you, again, if you decide to rent a space and, and buy your own equipment. So these are the three, in my opinion, simplified retail coffee models. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to business and business evolution. So like most businesses, it starts with one person. You have an idea, you think it's got a great chance of success. So you throw in your savings and you probably borrow some money from your family to get going. But the way that your business evolve often isn't the way that you plan. And I'm sure there's many a business owner who can attest to this. So as your business grows, you hire more people to support that growth. And I think it's really important that I mention this point now is that there's different retail models fit businesses at different business stages. So you may start with a roastery cafe and then in 15 years time, you may add a retail line. So that might work for one business, but it might not work for another. So it's important to know your business, know your strengths and your weaknesses, work to your strengths and, and also strengthen your weaknesses. And also the business has to work for the founder. And I think this point is really often forgotten. You know, founders of businesses always put their business first. And at the business, at the beginning, um, the business tends to come first at all costs, but this is unsustainable and it's pretty unhealthy. Um, some businesses completely pivot. For example, I think Blue Bottle began wholesaling at the beginning as well as retailing. And then they made the decision um, several years ago to stop wholesale altogether uh, and the only place you could get a blue bottle coffee was in a blue bottle cafe um, and then obviously they sold to Nestle a few years later for a crazy valuation so I'm sure at that time James the founder of blue bottle was making a future proof decision for his business so as the stage of the business grows, you have your second hire, and then you evolve into having multiple staff, layers of management, and there's also inevitably outside strings that are pulling on your business. And this can be anything from seed investors who are looking for a return on their investment to family members who've lent you some money, they thought perhaps for a couple of years, and they're, they're wanting it back to do something with it. And as you're trying to build and keep your business going, you need to keep all these different parts in mind and how your business evolves and how to future proof knowing what impact they have. So I'm going to touch a little bit on my background um, because I think it's it's basically formed my decisions to date um, and also my experience. So in um, 2008 I, I finished studying at the University of Edinburgh and at the time, I was working as a barista. So for four years through uni, I worked as a barista in Edinburgh. Um, excuse the dog outside barking. Um, and the um, when I moved to London, um, the there was no specialty coffee scene in Edinburgh to talk about. There was one in London, so luckily for me, I got to go down to uh, Fernandez and Wells and be a barista there. Um, with... Yeah, so when I moved to London, my first job was with Fernandez and Wells. And at the time, they were London's best um, cafe. And it was a great place to be because they had, uh, they were the first cafe in London to have a Senesso Syncra. We served Monmouth coffee and we're pulling 28 gram triple ristrettos. So it was a, a really great kind of place to be and learn about specialty coffee. But at the same time, they didn't pay more than minimum wage. And for anyone living in London, on minimum wage it doesn't quite doesn't quite work so with that in mind I decided to contact a bunch of different coffee roasters and say hey I'm good at making coffee I want to make a career out of this pretty hard working I think I'm pretty smart and good at teaching people things do you have something and the same day I had a response I interviewed in the afternoon and by I think close of play that day I had a job offer so that was 2009 
and there wasn't a plethora of specialty coffee jobs and I would have loved to have stayed in the industry I'd love to have worked in specialty coffee but there just wasn't a choice of jobs at that time in London um, so I worked in a commercial coffee roaster so they were called Drury they were an Italian family coffee roasting business and um, I think at the time the decision I made to step into the commercial coffee sector was definitely the best one for me you know I was future-proofing my skills so I could further my career plus the money that I was paid was more than the cafe and I could put that back into investing in myself through visiting other cafes, entering competitions and vol volunteering at coffee events. And in 2010, I was introduced by Adele Harris to a job that he was leaving. So he was leaving United Coffee, going to Has Been, and um, his job at United Coffee was trainer and, and, and overall interesting person around specialty coffee. And he was tasked with finding someone who, who was a bit of a match. And he knew that I was at Drury and I did something similar. So with my background in commercial coffee with them and my interest in specialty, I fitted the bill. And it was at this point, I was exposed to bigger customers, larger chains in the UK, and it became pretty obvious that there was more customers wanting specialty coffee. Um, but unfortunately, large commercial coffee roasters, as much as they'd like to be able to do specialty coffee and they can purchase it and they can roast it, it's more than just doing that when you are a supplier. You need There's so much more around it. And at the time, we would take customers on coffee tours around London and show them what was possible, but yet it couldn't be delivered. So these customers couldn't go to small roasters um, because they didn't quite appreciate commercials and machines and servicing and that whole package that is really important for, for larger customers. But at the time, I could see the gap emerging. I could see the opportunity for a large, scalable specialty coffee roaster that could do machines and servicing. But I wasn't quite ready at that point. I had the idea, but I don't think I had the right skills experience to really do a good job. So in 2013, I moved to Falcon and in that position, I supported roaster clients with consulting and I sold green to other roasters. And my involvement began with the SCA in 2010 when I was volunteering, judging, competing. As Vicente said, I was national coordinator for a couple of years. And so I became slightly more networked in the specialty coffee sector and I could see the opportunity growing. But it wasn't until 2015 that I launched uh, Modern Standard and coincidentally, it was on March the 8th, which is International Women's Day. And I didn't know that until about three years later. Um, so the idea again was to focus on the gap between big commercial and small specialty and kind of go for the middle. Um, and after a few months, uh, we launched um, into Sainsbury's. So we had two product lines. Um, basically, it was Sainsbury's, you know, they had five, we went into 500 stores at the beginning with two lines, uh, a pole bean line and a ground line. Um, and it went so well that the following year, they asked us to add on three more lines, which we did. And I think it's worth saying then that we're also seeing a lot of the customers in Sainsbury's transition up from buying from Sainsbury's onto our web shop. So they would find us through Sainsbury's and they would transition to the web shop because they would see on the back of the packet, the website, they'd see we had a larger range and they much preferred the customer experience that was that they were receiving on the web shop than from supermarkets. Um, but like everything, your business begins to evolve. And at this time, our wholesale was getting pretty strong. And we were sort of trying to figure out where we retail, where we wholesale, where we both. Um, but we had a vision in 2020. So back in 2019, we were planning the following year. Um, and our lease with our warehouse was coming to the end, the end of that year. And we knew we had to move. We needed to find something larger, something bigger, something that could help continue our growth. Um, and when we started the business in 2015, we based it down in Tilbury, a little uh, sort of town on the outskirts of uh, London. And 
we couldn't sell locally because there was no local market. We couldn't sell locally to London because we weren't inside London. Um, we tried to sell to Scottish companies. And as a Scottish person, I thought that'd be quite straightforward. Um, but my accent was good. My address wasn't. So as a result of, of that, they decided that we weren't going to be a, a good supplier. So we, we, we had no luck. So we targeted mainly national chains rather than at local businesses. But in 2020, we decided to move the roastery. And so in January 2020, we moved our roastery from um, Tilbury to my hometown in Fife. It's called Glenrothes. And my staff moved, which was fantastic. And at the same time, we decided to open up our first cafe. And for me, I learned to make coffee in Edinburgh. It was it was where my journey began. And so to have a cafe on the corner of where I used to live between uh, Brunsfield and, and Toll Cross, that's where uh, I used to live in Edinburgh near the university. A site came up on the corner, great spot. I thought this, this is meant to be. So we took it on and we opened our cafe at the end of 2020. So 2020 for us was quite a big year. We moved the roastery, coronavirus hit, and we all knew what that did. And we also opened a coffee shop. So quite a, a, rev, quite a revolution for our, our business. But it also gave us the chance to think, is this what we want to do? Do we want to keep selling in supermarkets? And like I said before, I think it's really important at different stages of your business, different retail path makes sense. And at this point, we had a great web shop, loads of customers coming on, finding us through Sainsbury's and staying with us on the web shop. We had a cafe that was selling more and more of our coffee, more subscriptions and all of that. And we made the decision to control our own retail and not let someone control it for us. So we said goodbye to Sainsbury's and the only way we would sell our coffee was direct or through our cafe. So that was our 2020 transition. And so I think it's worth touching upon some facts because I think a lot of people uh, will be interesting in what it did to our business and what going in and coming out of retail can do. So of course, our volume went down a little bit, but our gross and net profits went up, our flexibility increased, and ultimately the only thing that is the most important, in my opinion, was the customer experience went up. We had better customer service, we had better customer interaction, we had better customer reviews and more customer referrals. It took a few weeks for some customers to notice our absence, but once they did, we received tons of emails asking, was this a blip? Were we, were we out completely? And when we explained our reasons why, 99% of those customers emailed back positively and they began buying directly from us. So our bottom line hasn't changed. So the decision was financially positive and customer positive, which I think is the right thing. So, why, why future-proof? And I, and I think we all future-proof ourselves. For example, we try to eat healthy, we try to exercise, we try to sleep, we try to educate ourselves, we try to improve. And I think we're all trying to sort of make ourselves a better place for the future, both professionally and personally. And no one knows what will happen tomorrow. And I, I do think that 2020 taught us all a lesson in that regard. But future-proofing is critical because as people, our requirements change and evolve. We go from being, you know, on our own to being, you know, in a relationship. And in my instance, beginning of the business, I had no children. Now I have children. So my my future proofs, you know, decisions are slightly different. And same in your business. You go from you to having more people, to having more customers, to more suppliers, more outside strings, perhaps investors. So you need to think of all these things and prepare yourself and your business for what could possibly happen next. So in future-proofing, in, in my opinion, there's two, there's two main ways to future-proof your business. One is to exit, which isn't a dirty word. I think most people who start businesses don't really think of what to do with them at the end. And again, what they will look like and each decision you know, impacts both on themselves and their business. So with an exit, it allows you the opportunity to, to enjoy the fruits of your labor. It allows you the chance to perhaps work for someone else for a while, let them take the leads and, and support them in their growth for their business. 
because your experience would be invaluable. And the other sort of way to sort of future-proof your business is to evolve. And so to make your business stronger and more robust so you can ride out any future events. This might be opening more stores to hit that critical mass that can financially support a central administration structure to keep those stores operating. It might be adding more products, um, some NPD, uh, some brewing equipment, and perhaps machines and servicing. And I know I said we wouldn't mention it, but wholesale, you know, most businesses do tend to eventually go from retail into wholesale to offset some risk. And because people might come into your cafe, love what you do, and think, I'd love to serve this in my restaurant or cafe or whatever. And that way you can utilize your equipment and your staff to earn more money. Now, how to future-proof? I think now that we've explained why, it would be helpful if I explained how. And I won't touch upon the evolution of your business. Again, only you know what's best, but it's but in terms of exiting, I think this is probably a topic that I can talk a bit more about. So for those of you that don't know, uh, three years after I founded Modern Standard, I sold half of it uh, to a Danish bakery called Olenstein, who have about 90 odd shops in Copenhagen and Denmark. Uh, now they've got about 13 shops in the UK and uh, two or three in New York. This in fact was their future-proof strategy as they made their own bread, baked their own cakes and pastries, but they had a coffee roaster partner in Denmark and they saw that specialty coffee was such a growing market, very important in their future growth plans. So rather than buying a roaster, getting a consultant, having them help set up just a function within their business that would take green coffee, make it brown, they chose slightly more of an entrepreneurial route where they would invest in a growing specialty coffee roaster um, so they could benefit from their insight and return could benefit them with their volume of coffee. And I think we'd both agree that they never really invested in one standard, they invested in me and my business vision. And the relationship has been 100% positive. I often think, you know, but I look back after I did the deal and think, oh, that's a bad idea, I should never have done it. I have never once regretted it. 100% has been the best decision that I've made both for future proofing modern standard and for myself. Again, I think you need to remember these businesses that we create, they have a huge impact on us as people. And I think we often have to remember the impact that that has. Um, the partnership, again, you know, has allowed me to work with some really smart, um, successful people who Olenstein is led at the moment by a guy called Jason Cotta before he was CEO of Costa when they did their deal with Coke. So great guy, super knowledgeable and happy to share his his. Um, his sort of experience with me, and I'm learning so much. Uh, again, with the private equity backers, what they see as business opportunities, how they grow them, and all of this I find very, very interesting. So for me, I'm still on my journey with Modern Standard. The business continues to evolve and grow. Uh, we're looking to add more stores, increase our wholesale. Um, and now that we have this base in Scotland, and now my address and accent fit, we've had such an interest locally from businesses who want to work with us. So we're seeing that as a new strand of our future proof. I'd very much like to say thank you for having me on today. Um, it's been a pleasure sharing my story. And if anybody would like to get in touch, you can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, um, and just, yeah, we can continue the conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you very much for sharing the story, okay. your story and the story of your of your business. Okay, so we're going to get to the Q&A. Um, okay. uh, uh, I've asked the audience to drop their, their questions for you in the chat. And so I'll read them out to you as, as they come in. <clears throat> I have a few questions of my own okay. for you. Um, when my colleague, Julie, who's one of the producers uh, for Retail Summit, asked me yeah. if I wanted to host a session with you, at first, I have to be honest, I wasn't sure. I thought, I'm not sure that this is, you know, I'm not an expert in this topic. Um, sure. But she told me what the what the angle was and sort of how you've made decisions uh, for your business um, and for yourself and for your family. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I thought, I thought that story was really interesting. There's so many levels here and I have lots of questions. I wasn't totally sure where to start. 
But I wanted to maybe take a step back, Lindsay, if, if, mm -hmm. if it's okay with you, sure. and give our audience, especially our audience who are watching from outside of the UK, yeah. some context on the significance of some of the business decisions that you've made, right? And so I was looking up some numbers. Um, Sainsbury's, for those who don't mm -hmm. know, founded in 1869, 1869. Uh, it's the second largest chain of supermarkets in the United Kingdom. It has 16% share of the supermarket sector. And as of 2019, has a total of uh, 1,400 plus supermarkets and convenience shops, right? Um, and, and Sainsbury's, uh, as a reminder for, for everybody watching, is, is the supermarket chain that, that Lindsay partnered with in 2015 and, uh, and, and, and the partnership that she ended in 20... 2020. No, 2020. 2020. You're five years, yeah. Um, so I found that particularly interesting. Olenstein, Danish bakery with uh, about 100 branches, Denmark. Yeah, I think mean, in total over 100, yeah. yeah. Paris, New York, uh, focused on high quality artisanal breads, cakes, pastries. Um, very different, very different. It, it seems almost maybe counterintuitive for an entrepreneur in the United Kingdom for somebody to start a partnership with Sainsbury's and then go, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, no, I, th I think at the time it was the right thing for us to do. You know, we were trying, I, I started the business because I seen the opportunity for scaled specialty because everybody was so focused to be really small and niche. And, you know, there's, there's I mentioned to you last night when we chatted that the majority of coffee roaster businesses are male owned and, and you mm -hmm. know, they're, they all, I think sometimes they, they tend to compete against each other and I didn't really care. Like my, my focus is I want you to kind of go forward and have fun and enjoy what I did. So I wanted to see where it went and my specialty coffee, when I started in 2010, you know, I was so interested. I became national coordinator and at the time I just wanted more people to be interested in specialty coffee. Like we're all here. We all love the industry. We're all trying to grow it. And so we were all guilty, I think, early 2010, 2011, 2012. We're all trying to, like, make it smaller. We're all trying to, like, oh, you drink coffee from Costa. What do you know? And I think there was a lot of that, a lot of shaming to people who, who weren't in our sector. And that generally kind of upset me. So it's quite, you know, I, we're trying to be inclusive, not exclusive. And I think one of the things I wanted to do was, you know, where where could where where would it be unusual to take specialty coffee? Well, of course, at a supermarket, nobody was doing. When Waitrose, who are a smaller supermarket in the UK, did have specialty roasters, but Sainsbury's and Tesco didn't. And so we were like the first one to get listed. You know, we kind of a lot of the roasters at the time in London were like, "Oh, why are they going to supermarkets for?" And now, the funny thing is, they're all trying to get listed. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not trying to say we started a trend. We, I don't think we did, but I think we definitely made it more normal and made it more kind of like acceptable. Um, I, I, I don't really particularly care what people think. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But my aim in, in life and my professional career is just to spread more the love of specialty coffee to more people and get more people interested because that is beneficial to everyone who works within this sector. It's not just to me and to you, but to everyone. We should all try and work together and, and not against each other. So, yeah, I think, mm. but then moving out, we then let someone else go in. But I think what Sainsbury's have done is they've put their own brand. They've, they've kind of created their own specialty coffee range mm -hmm. to kind of fit where we left. So, yeah. What did you learn about your customer during the time that you that you partnered with Sainsbury's? They were keen to know more. Like, I think with coffee, we never know enough. None of us know everything and we need to be open-minded. And when customers get into coffee, like they might start by having like a, a milk-based, like espresso beverage. They then they go into something stronger, maybe filter coffee, maybe espresso, maybe pour over. And they were, they were just hungry for knowledge. And they were hungry to try other things and be part of it because... You know, like there's less and less people drinking alcohol now. More and more people are going, you know, into like coffee and tea and soft beverages. And they just want to have something they're interested in. You know, I, mm -hmm. I have many friends who like, I'm sure we all in coffee have these friends who just text you on like WhatsApp or message and like, oh, so I bought this machine. How do I use it? And 
what coffee can I buy? And, you know, when, when I got going, I had loads of friends in Scotland who were starting cafes and they'd ask me, who should I, who should I use? And I would tell them, use like artisan roast or use a local roaster up in Scotland who can help you and give you the knowledge that you want, that you, you so desperately want. Um, and get involved in the industry, volunteer at events, get into judging. Um, yeah, so I think everyone's hungry and I think we've got a community and we just need to keep it going. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you, and, and, and coming back to your customer, though, there was a transition there from Sainsbury's to mm -hmm. the web shop. To the web shop, yeah. Why? I think, well, I think everyone trades up, you know. I think it's like... Uh, you get into something like I, the last couple of years, I've got into like photography more and you trade up, you want to know more, you want to get the better equipment. The more money you have, the more time you have available, you, you, you kind of want to pursue those passions. Mm -hmm. So I think with coffee, people would try our coffee and it was markedly different to anything else on the shelf. Some people didn't like it. So not to say that everything, you know, we, we didn't like wow everyone. We'd often get emails, oh, your coffee is not strong enough or something like that. But that's fine because there's a coffee for everyone. But we would often get people who would like it, want to know more, go on the website, see the larger range, and then buy a couple to try at home. So, yeah, we had this – people just come in and they would just keep going. And and so that's been great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was um, – um, <clears throat> another question that I had, that I had for Julie, um, our, one of our producers, initially when we were talking about – about your talk, uh, I wanted to understand why future proof. What is it? What you know? Um, and so I had to look it up, and I wrote down the 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 uh, the definition from the Cambridge yeah. Dictionary. So future proofing refers to the process of anticipating the future and developing methods of minimizing the effects or shocks and stresses, or the effects of of shocks and stresses of future events. <clears throat> and I, excuse me, I get the sense. Um, from speaking to you and from your presentation that when you think of future proofing your business, you weren't just making decisions for the business. It wasn't just about anticipating shocks and stresses in the market per se, but about prioritizing your plans, your personal plans for your future, for your future, the personal guiding the business. Yeah. Talk to us yeah. a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think, again, like I mentioned, many people begin businesses and they just put themselves second all the time. I've been guilty of it. Like many times the decision has been made, do I go on holiday or do I do I work? And work always comes first. Thankfully, my partner Hannah is very supportive, but I don't know for how much longer because I think with many times I've missed family events or holidays or whatever, it's just getting a bit much. Um, so no, you have to make decisions that, benefit you because if your business goes in one path and you go on another eventually you have to exit you have to, to get out and you have to be fair to the people that work with you and you know because they've joined your business and they've supported your growth and if you just don't help support them then that's kind of unfair so also when we moved the roastery from down south to Scotland one of the things I sold to my guys was you know, you could all buy, you could all buy houses. You would never have had that chance down south. You know, in London, we all know how crazy house prices are. Everyone's in that rental cycle. So I could say to them, like, move to Scotland, buy a house, future-proof yourself personally, so you have the security. And now they're all buying houses. We've been there a year. They've all saved up their money. Scotland is, is obviously so much cheaper than than London. Uh, there's more space um the air's nicer there's loads of benefits um mm -hmm. so for me like I yes I future-proofed the business because I think it was the I thought and I do still believe it was the right thing to do we haven't lost any customers in London they actually will all want to come and visit us in Scotland so that's nice mm -hmm. and for my staff they've they've now got roots they've all got property when they get older they're going to be more secure financially so for me like they've helped me grow my business and I want to give back to them and help them, you know, to secure themselves. So it's a, it's a personal and a business thing. And we must always forget that we must always remember both of those strands. So hmm. you said um, during your presentation, exit isn't a dirty word. It isn't. No, I think this is a problem. People think, oh, look, she sold or he's sold or they've sold or you've taken investment. I think you've created a business and someone's liked it 
enough to give you money for it. Like, isn't that great? You know, if you have a shop and people come in to buy your coffee, it's because they like what you've made. You don't want to have a shop that no one comes into because that'd be really sad and your business wouldn't work. So yeah, many people, you know, shame it. And I think that's wrong. Again, it's, we've got people who want to come into our sector. We have people who are interested in what we are all obsessed about. And so for me, when I was approached at first, I was a bit like, oh, do, do I, do I, don't I, you know, I've thought of everything. And then quickly it became quite an obvious answer. It was like, of course, they had the same vision. They don't bother me. You know, I'm quite headstrong. Those that know me, I'm, 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 I just get on with it. I don't tend to mess about. Things are very much black and white in my book. There really isn't a gray area. And so I, I crack on, I, I keep my business moving forward. I, I look after my staff, my customers and my suppliers. And that means my partners are happy. I supply them with a great product. I give them my insight. I sometimes email them crazy ideas for marketing things because I'm quite a creative thinker. So they benefit from that too. Um, I think they'd love to maybe be able to control me a little bit more, but I think they've learned to live with it. So it works well. <laughs> We've got a good partnership. So, yeah. Right. So one big decision to, yeah. to, to you know, to, to leave the partnership with Sainsbury's, yeah. uh, start Modern Standards' own web shop. And yeah. then on top of that in 2020, and I, uh, we're not going to go, we're not going to delve into pandemic world, but sure. the same year as the pandemic, you decide I'm going to move my roastery from near London to Scotland. Yeah, 500 miles. I think 500 miles. 400. Yeah, yeah. I read somewhere that, th that um, this came from an idea that your mom had. You said, <laughs> yeah. My mom had this crazy <laughs> idea of moving the business back to Glenrothes. How did that happen? Yeah. Well, I think we must always remember our mothers are always right. I think we, we, can, we can all um, attest to that. So my mum was, I was talking to her about, you know, I need more space. And my mum's interested in my business. Of course, every parent, you know, wants the best for their children. And so I was moaning, oh, I just can't find enough space. Brexit had happened. All the warehouses were rented around where we were looking. And there was just nothing available. And if it was available, it was gone the same same day. So she suggested, why don't you move it to Glenrothes? Because there was many big warehouses. There's not as much competition. And, you know, Scotland's lovely. And I think my mum was also trying to, like, pull me back to Scotland. Um, you know, I've been away now for 13 years. And I think deep down she'd love it if I moved home. I, I haven't. You know, I still live in London with, with Hannah and the kids. And I'm never probably going to move home. Um, but, yeah, it was her idea. And yeah I, I thank her every day for suggesting it because if she hadn't I don't think I would have come up with it I am um, yeah hmm. good old mum let's get to let's thank you Lindsay let's get to some of the questions here uh from the sure. audience um okay. so our first question so many business founders think about future proofing their business by looking for an exit strategy but some really struggle to hand over the thing they created to a new partner how did you find yes. that process you have to let go. I think it, I get it. You know, you, it's like a, like having a child. You, you know, you've created something and you love it. And you, again, you put yourself second to it. You put everything into it, and it's like someone taking it away. It does. It, it pulls on your heartstrings, but you need to be able to compartmentalize that and just, you know, it's a phase in your life. It's like going to school. You you go. You you get educated and you leave. You know, you you leave it behind. It's a it's a phase. So. Yeah, I know it's hard and sometimes many businesses and the founder are kind of interlinked, you know, they're very much the business. And I've always tried to not be that. I've always tried to, yes, obviously be linked to it, but not be it. Um, hmm. So, yeah, you just have to go to therapy. I don't know, but just try and sort of just take it as a, as, as a lovely thing. It's, it's nice. If someone wants to take your business on and forward, let them do it and you can go off and, and do something else. Mm -hmm. We don't have to talk uh, specifics on numbers, but if you're comfortable, yes. uh, what advice, you know, or what, what, what can you share about, you know, sort of the process of, you know, what percentage Olenstein would take of the company, that kind of thing? Yeah, so we're 50-50. Um, and I think, mm -hmm. again, 
our paths are now aligned and, and that's great because I, I do want to probably exit at some point I, I get very jealous of friends of mine in the coffee sector saying they're changing jobs and I think oh that would be lovely to try something new because you know it's it's but that's just decisions that I've made. But yeah, we're on a we're on a journey. They're looking to I don't know exit in a couple of years. They're they're owners anyway. And at that point, I think if they sell it, the new buyers have an option, but not a requirement to buy me out. So the new buyers might like that I'm the kind of partner, minority partner in this coffee business. They happen to have an interest in. They like the fact that I run it like it's my own. I still make decisions as if again it's I, I, I'm the I'm the CEO. I'm the person in charge. It buck stops with me, and I think it does work well. I think when businesses are often bought over, people try to remove the management, try to change. The, what, what that's what you've bought. You've not bought a business. You've mm. bought the people. Mm. Um, so yeah, I might get purchased out I'll probably stay because I love it um I might go I, I don't know what I'll do um but I think yeah it's not a bad thing it's a good thing and life goes on so great great we have another question here um this person says hey Lindsay great presentation I wanted to ask you a question again regarding future proofing a company you mentioned that you can either exit yeah. or evolve when feature proofing the company yeah. in regards to evolving, how much of this evolving process is based on technology, hardware, software, et cetera? Do they play a key role in the process? Yeah, I think if you can automate as much as you can, of course, you know, you can save yourself a lot of uh, labor costs um, and you make things so much more efficient. Um, yeah, I think every business now is trying to be better on their website, better on their you know, their sales process, better customer experience. Everybody wants things. Everybody, every customer wants you to be Amazon. They want to have the next day. They want to have everything like quickly and slick and, and track it and, and tracking and everything. And I think, well, we're always, we're always not Amazon, but we're all trying to be better. So I think everyone's trying to be, you know, yeah, better customer experience. So yeah, I think future proofing would be just giving more to the customer than your competitor. And I think that's ultimately how you'll keep your business strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another question here, going back to Sainsbury's. Um, yep. Were there any compromises that you had to make to have your coffee be accepted in a large supermarket chain? Yes, many. So the funniest one was the bag size. So so we all sell in like, well, in the UK anyway, 250 gram and kilos and whatever. And supermarkets are half a pound. So it's like 227 gram, which just seems so strange. The bags had to be a certain uh, width. They couldn't be too wide because it's all about space on the shelf. Um, couldn't be too high. So they, they pretty much give you the space they want to give you. and You just have to make your bag fit. And that's why most of the bags are pretty much the same. Uh, um, in terms of other stuff, compromise well we didn't put a strength on our bag so most coffees have strength four strength five and we, we didn't do that and they were trying to get us to do that but I, I was like no we're not trying to be commercial we're trying to be specialty so we stopped that but those were the main ones um and again we want you to put like a roasted on which they said no because that would confuse people they might think that was the best before, even though it said roasted on next to the number. It's, you know, they assume people just don't read. Um, so we had to do just just best before. But towards the end, they were more happy to have both roasted on and best before. So, yeah, there was a couple, but nothing too severe. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, on a personal level. Yeah. You know, uh, what has it been like for you? And I know you still live in London, but the, your business... Uh, mm -hmm. your baby or one of your babies the business yeah. <laughs> has has come home what has that yeah. been like for you it's been lovely like I um so I left I left an office at 18 I went to uni I first of all went to Newcastle to do dentistry which is quite ironic considering I have a, I've got braces now um, um but then I went to Edinburgh and, and studied there and then I went to London and then I never thought I'd ever go home and I would only visit did you just say like, you studied theatre Dentistry, dentist. At, at, oh, sorry, I misunderstood Me, that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I did two, year, two years medical school because it's basically, that's the Got first it. two years of dentistry. Uh, yeah, I didn't like it. Too much too much lectures, too much studying, not enough fun. Um, 
so I changed and then went to do another other, another course. Um, but yeah, I, I left Glenrothes at 18, never ever thinking I would return, ever. Um, I'd go home twice a year, visit my parents. They would more likely come to London to visit me. There was more things to do. But going, going home was lovely because, um, you know, I could see my aunties, my uncles, my brother, his kids. You know, I could see family. I could meet up with school friends that I hadn't seen. And it became this sort of really nice, like, quite nostalgic, you know, because I think when I would go home, I thought, do I miss it? And do I want to move home? But I would remind myself that I, I couldn't survive there. I think me and Glenothis aren't a good fit in terms of what we want out of life. It's too slow. Mm things don't happen quick enough London's got that energy it has that vibe you know um but going home is lovely and again when the pandemic hit and you know everything was a bit weird I'd have like, all my aunties and uncles just pop up to the roastery and be like hey how's it going I've brought you some cake because I'm bored and here's you know here's some soup that I've made and like it was really quite it was nice so I got to I got to sort of be uh, well looked after. Um, and again, family always support you and they always help you. Um, so having that around me was lovely. I don't think it would have been as fun not being there the last 18 mm -hmm. months. So yeah, right. it was good. So that's really interesting. <clears throat> what you just said makes me think that, uh, you know, for you personally, uh, your living situation, London is more your yes. style. Whereas for yes, the business, however, Glenroth, this is the right place because you wanted you wanted to take the business in a different direction. It seems like that's what fit. Yeah. Well, I think we, we could never sell locally. Like we were local to nobody mm. down in Essex at, at all. Nobody was interested. Mm. My accent wasn't local. They didn't like that. And then in Scotland, our address was wrong. And so by coming home, having the address and the accent, it, it just clicked and all, all this interest became. And by that point, we were quite established. We had a, have a nice slick brand and you know kind of cool, cool stuff going on and many people wanted to be a part of that and take our learnings from London to to Scotland you know they wanted to understand what we could do to their business because if you can make it in London you can really make it many places um but most of our customers in London didn't really care where our mostly was as long as we had the support mechanism to support them in London, trainers, account management, service engineers, they were happy. They didn't really mind. And if they come and visit us, we can kind of spend some time together. Scotland's a lovely place. You know, Fife has many, you know, nice little fishing villages and restaurants that, you know, we can have more of a nicer customer experience rather than just going to a warehouse in like east of London and thinking, oh, this is this is okay, but what do you do after? I mean, we can make more of an event of it. But no, coming home is great. Um, and yeah, I think customers have probably a appreciated it as well because you know we're, we're happier we're healthier give them better service you know it's, it's all good mm -hmm. what was the um the so the process of coming of, of of moving the the process of moving the business from south to north it makes me think of of you know um this may not be familiar i wasn't familiar with this before i moved to the united kingdom seven sure. years ago but the sort of north south divide what what part of um did, you know was there was there um, an additional layer there for you in terms of making a sort of statement by saying i'm i'm i don't have to be my business doesn't have to be in the south to succeed it can be up north as well was there was there some part of I you that was thinking of that um yeah yes and no I think I mean I left Edinburgh there was no coffee scene like there was 2008 there wasn't a specialty coffee shop at all and the time that I was away and I came back you know quite a few had opened a few roasteries but it, it didn't feel very authentic it felt quite uh kind of sh not so much shallow was my way of putting it but there was so much knowledge in London and London had exploded from 2008 to 2015 of coffee shops you know roasteries and everything else and I had learned so much and been involved kind of coming back was my way of maybe just supporting Scotland and helping like my my, my local neighborhood with more employment and trying to take what I've learned and benefit businesses up up in Scotland but yet, yes there is a north south divide but you know Vicente you live in London I live in London we're not from London London is a complete mm -hmm. mix of so many different people and you can learn so much therefore from that um, and but yet by going back I wanted to kind of just take my learning learnings and utilize that in a place where there was 
potentially less competition and more opportunity. So. Mm -hmm. I saw that um, you were finally able to open, you have a, a cafe in Edinburgh mm -hmm. and you were finally able to open the cafe and be used in a, in, a, in a way that it was meant to be used. What has that, what has that been like? Yeah, so when we opened, we did two weeks of people could come in, could come in, and then the government changed rules, and you had to be served. It was takeaway only. Then a week, a month later, it was just at the door. You couldn't even come into the premises. And so for the last couple of months, it's been nice to have people in and yeah, experience the coffee that we want to serve them. So we we now have this huge amount of control over that customer experience. Um, we've we've, we've learned our trade find it and then we've come to Edinburgh and a lot of people thought we were quite new hmm. they didn't think we had any history they thought we were just a cafe they had you know they had been quite aware of us but a few people in Edinburgh had been by buying us online finding us in Sainsbury's so a lot of it kind of like clicked in their minds that hmm. we were a bit more established um, but yeah it's, it's been great and we're, our customer interaction and our customer experience has just been you know next level and I, I honestly don't think we'll go back into retail on a supermarket level anyway. Um, it's just way more fun not being in supermarkets. Mm -hmm. it, it, you talked about controlling the customer experience there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's ultimately what we're doing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have one more, one more question. This one's from the audience. Um, how was it how was it like for you to grow into the various leadership roles did it come naturally to you or was it a big learning curve um i think i probably didn't realize i had all the skills available i have i've got good skills in terms of being a business being an entrepreneur um i think some people find themselves just forced into it it kind of happened it's happened with me and I don't mind kind of doing the dirty jobs or the difficult jobs or the, the timely jobs you know I, I don't mind doing everything and, and nothing um but yeah you have to evolve and improve yourself and again future proof your skills so yes my I'm very good with numbers uh I'm great with finances I get sales and marketing you know I I'm passionate about the coffee industry I think that in itself sells but yeah I still had to learn more about you know you know, tendering and sales pitches and all the all the stuff that makes your business slightly more kind of commercial focused. While at the same time, you know, teaching and passing on skills and experiences that I had to people who joined our business who wanted to work within coffee and coffee roasting and quality assurance and all of that. So, yeah, I think I've done an okay job at most things, but I do try and obviously spend time improving myself and improving my knowledge because that in turn benefits me and the business. So. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't been easy. Uh, I sometimes wish someone could come in and be like, oh, Lindsay, just take a holiday for the next six months. I've got this. But you often think to yourself, they'll never do it as well as you could because they don't work as hard. So, yeah, hmm. control freak. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, <laughs> thank you so much for, no, for your presentation you. and for the Q&A. It's been, it's been really great. Uh, remind everybody, please, where they can find you and if and if they can get in touch with you, where they yeah, can Yeah, of course. They're absolutely welcome. Um, my email's on the website. Uh, you can get me on LinkedIn, um, Twitter, whatever, just any sort of social media. Yeah, I'll get back in touch when I've got some time. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And thanks, everybody, no, for, thank for joining you. us for this session.